Hello, and welcome to Humanities Matter, brought to you by Brill. I am Emily Tampkin, and this week we will be looking at key issues in the field of humanities. I'm speaking today with Dr. Adam Talib. He is the Assistant Professor and Director of Studies in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures at Durham University in the UK. And we are going to be discussing his piece, Al Safadi, His Critics, and the Drag of Philological Time. Adam, thank you so much for uh, for taking some time today. Thank you for inviting me. So before we get started, for our listeners, um, how do you, as the author of this piece, define philological time? Okay, that's a very good question because it's sort of in the title of the article. Um, mm -hmm. I So when I talk about philological time, I essentially am talking about the, the history of Arabic literature, right? So the history of writing in Arabic, which um, dates back probably um, in classical Arabic one to two centuries before the prophet and mm -hmm. carries on in classical Arabic until the beginning of the 20th century. So it's this very long period, you know, more than a millennium, nearly a millennium and a half of literary history. Um, and it's not quite as old as Chinese literature, but it is among the oldest world literatures. And the geographical expanse is huge. So in addition to it being very old, um, it also spreads from, you know, uh, the North Africa, West Africa, uh, the, the Red Sea, part southern Spain, um, all the way over to the Indian subcontinent and into Southeast Asia. Okay. So you, um, you know, if anyone listening wants to pull up uh, Adam's bio, you've worked on this for quite some time. You've written a book. You've written chapters of books. Um, why did you feel that the time was sort of right to write about al Safadi and the drag of philological time? Like, how did this fit into your broader body of research? Yeah, well, okay. So I started as a fresh-faced, um, you know, graduate student in 2008, let's say. I started working on my PhD. And at the time, the big campaign was to turn our attention to Arabic literature being produced after... Um, uh, after a period of political turbulence, so we have the you know the Crusades, and then you have uh, the Mongol invasion, and you have the Black Death in the Middle East, and people thought that um, the quality of intellectual intellectual and cultural production um, in the Arabic speaking world was markedly less good after those you know turbulent political events. So mm -hmm. a group of people um, started you know way be a decade before me um, working on recovering that history, and that's how I kind of got into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how do you see this as as fitting into or not the other writing that you've done? Do you see it as a well, standalone or in conversation with? Um, so I, I I think it is a standalone. But of course, I mean, so in this article, what I'm trying to do is to hold my my earlier self accountable, if that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So in my you know in the first phase, let's say over the past decade, what I've been doing is I've been quite um, let's say in campaign mode. You know, I've been trying to uncover literary history. I've been working a lot in manuscripts. I've been sort of bringing things to light and trying to draw um, people's attention to the value of this material. Uh, mm -hmm. So in this article, I actually wanted to stop for a second and sort of think to myself about whether, um, you know, whether there is intrinsic value in what I've been doing over the past decade and like where we are now. I mean, so if we've spent about roughly 20 years uh, in a revisionist campaign to redeem this period of Arabic literary history. Mm -hmm. uh, now I think it's kind of time for us to stop and say, where are we? Um, and what has our revisionist scholarship done? Like, I mean, you know, in what way is, is revisionism also another form of distortion? Mm. Can you say a bit, a bit more about that? When you say revisionism is a form of distortion, do you mean that you are um, undoing or redoing the past? You mean it's unfair to the writers as they were writing? Kind of what, say more about what you mean by that, please. Yeah, well, so, I mean, if you think about uh, political time, if you think about like a political reading of history, right? So people used to think that because of turbulent political events and because of, let's presume, uh, contracting, you know, like a contracting economy um, mm -hmm. in the Arab world, then the literary and cultural production would have been less valuable, uh, especially when people are drawing comparisons to late medieval and early modern Europe. You know, so the argument goes that because of these big world historical factors, ergo, the cultural production is not as good. And so I spent, and me and lots of other people who've done more than me, spent time saying that isn't true and that we need to take these things seriously. 
and read them in their own terms. But of course, in doing that, you um, you know you focus intently on a period of time, and you do it in kind of a. Um, I mean, I don't want to say uh, tendentious. I'm not. I don't think we were making arguments out of thin air, but we obviously were, um, you know, advocating a particular ideology mm-hmm. in doing that, right? I mean, if you're if you say to your colleagues, "I am going to deliberately study this neglected period of literary history," then you've already told them what the outcome of your study will be, right? right. I mean, yes. nobody nobody thinks that a period of literary history is neglected and er- and then will continue to sort of say that it's, it deserves to be neglected. I mean, you say it's neglected, and then you, you make a case for why it should no right. longer you're signifying be neglected. Something, you're signifying something by the very fact that you're saying this has been a neglected period. Totally, yeah. 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 Um, where do you, could I just ask where you, you know, you've gone in one direction, you've gone in the other now. Um, where at kind of the end of this one-off journey do you find yourself on revisionism? Oh, well, that, that, okay, that's a very difficult question. Um, I think revisionism is a very healthy scholarly practice. Mm-hmm. And I think I will always be a revisionist. I mean, you know, it's very like it's very scholarship is boring and it's lonely and it's slow. And in order for me to be motivated enough to do an activity that's boring and slow and lonely, I need to mm-hmm. feel like I have some skin in the game. So revisionism is a way that I approach my work. Mm-hmm. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? It makes a lot of sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think I'll always be a revisionist. I mean, I am just interested in helping people think better about things. And so I kind of have, I kind of adopt that position in my scholarship. Right. Um, and then finally, if I, if you could give us a sense of, of what's next, what the next, um, what, what's the next interesting product that will be the result of the boring, lonely work that you do? Um, well, okay. So in, in a, what, what I'm currently working on is is not related to this material. So I spent, let's say, uh, the first decade of my career very interested in 14th uh, and 15th century literary culture and what mm-hmm. followed after that. Yeah. Um, I'm currently working on a project in, in which I, I'm writing a book about the way that sexual violence is depicted in classical Arabic literature and mm-hmm. also trying to draw connections to um, Persian and Ottoman literature. Oh, wow. And... Last last question, I promise. What sort of prompted the the move from the one to the other, other than the fact that you've been working on this for a decade now? Um, well, I, I think that uh, the topic kind of engaged me. Um, you know, the the kind of the topic. But I approach like so. I I approach all things as uh, readerly problems, right? So I want to understand how readers make sense of text, especially texts from the past. I mean, because mm-hmm. that's the, the thing that I'm most interested in. Mm-hmm. So just as, you know, in this article, I'm trying to understand how scholars can take one particular work of literary history and make it into an exceptional, uh, kind of like a literary masterpiece. There's this kind of, you know, way of reading a literary masterpiece, which is different from reading an ordinary historical text. So I'm also interested now in how we as a scholarly community and how readers at the time would have understood uh, these representations of sexual violence. I was speaking with Dr. Adam Talib of Durham University. Um, we were speaking about his work, including his piece, al his critics, and the drag of philological time published in Philological Encounters. Adam, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you.